Okay, so yeah, welcome again, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for the first webinar organized by the Microanalysis Society. I'm Annette Vonderhand. I'm just the technical support here. Um, this webinar will be presented by Vince Minkowski. Vin is a senior scientist in the Structural Materials Organization at General Electric Research. Um, in this role, he performs surface analysis um, all the time um, to support research programs at GE Research um, and its businesses and strategic partners. Um, a few words to Win. Uh, Win got his bachelor's in chemistry from Marshall University and a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Vin then had a postdoctoral position at Argonne National Lab, um, where his work resulted in R&D awards, and then he moved on to GE. Vin has authored um, close to 100 publications, many more internal reports, and various book chapters, and holds, also holds various patents. Um, Vin has been actively involved in the Microanalysis Society for many years and served in various roles on the board. So we are very, very happy that um, he agreed to present this webinar today um, with the title Surface Microscopy and Microanalysis in an Industrial Research and Development Laboratory, General Electric Research. Um, before we start, a uh, quick technical um, information after his presentation, there will be time for a Q&A session where he will try to answer any of your questions. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat function. Um, I will keep an eye on that and go through them and uh, Vin will then answer them during the Q&A session where there's also an option to pose questions. Um, also, this presentation will be recorded and we will post, post it to the MAS YouTube channel. So you can always go back and revisit parts of his presentation. Um, and if you have any technical problems or technical questions, uh, please feel free also to put them in the chat uh, for me, Annette. And I will try to help you. Um, with that, um, I hand over to Vin, and um, I hope you enjoy all this webinar. Thank you. Okay, so this is Vince Mikowski. I'd like to start by thanking Annette and MAS for uh, providing the opportunity to give this um, remote talk. It's an honor to be asked to provide the first one. I hope it's um, of use to the community, and I look forward to seeing more coming out in the near future. I'm presenting the work. However, it's important to note that much of what I'll be showing are data that were collected by my colleagues. Uh, Lori Latart and Gilad Zorn are both still at the Research Center. Uh, my former colleague, John Chira, retired. And our other colleague, Han Piao, uh, moved on to Fuji. But I definitely want to start by acknowledging them for the work that they did and that I'll be uh, sharing. So I just want to give a really fast talk outline. The first thing I'd like to do is give an overall introduction to the Microanalysis Society for the people that aren't aware. Um, I then you know, need to say a few words about the General Electric Research Facility, the place that I work. And then we're gonna jump into the scientific talk. And the first thing that I want to do is, you know rapidly define what we're talking about as far as surface. When you talk to 10 different people, you'll usually get eight different answers. So we kind of want to be sure everybody's kind of on the same um, plane. And what I really want to do is I don't want to talk about how the instruments work, but I want to show unique examples of um, data that we were able to collect using OJ electron spectroscopy X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and time of flight secondary ion mass spectroscopy. You all have to keep in mind that I work in an industrial setting, so a lot of what we do, you know, we can't share all the details. 
So I can't necessarily give a lot of background on a number of the um, examples, but you'll be able to understand how we addressed issues and kind of put pieces together on how these tools may help you with your research. And then I want to close by just looking to the future. What do the next generation tools need to have? And then, you know, summary, conclusion, and thank you. So MAS is a nonprofit organization that's led by the volunteer members. The society's mission is to advance and disseminate knowledge concerning the principles, instrumentation, and applications of microanalysis down to the atomic level. Um, on this page, we show a, a photo of the current president, Rhonda Stroud. Um, her term will be expiring soon, and then Heather will be taking over. In the middle of the page, we have the logo for the upcoming microscopy and microanalysis meeting. Everyone's aware that the in-person meeting was canceled. However, the teams put a tremendous amount of time into assembling a virtual meeting. So please look into the virtual meeting details. If you want to learn more about surface analysis, we're hosting a large number of sessions so you can hear from other people talking about their research. On the far right panel, it's just a um, snippet from one of the uh, topical conferences that were held uh, recently. So a lot of people want to know what's the structure of MAS because that may help you become engaged. So the executive council, it's elected representatives and they're elected by the members. It's comprised of six directors and five officers, the president, president-elect, past president, secretary, and treasurer. There are also officers that are appointed by the president um, upon approval of the executive council to transact the society's business. There are committees and the committees have chairs which are appointed by the executive council as it considers necessary or helpful to manage the society. And with all the meetings, there are also program chairs. So the, the annual m and meeting um, has a MAS co-chair. The topical conferences have chairs. And another part of this society that's very important is the Affiliated Regional Societies, abbreviated ARIES. And this is really where the local researchers get together in a geographical area to share ideas. And, you know, they're um, approved by the MAS Council and they have the stamp of approval. So MAS is always looking for um, new people to step up, join the society, provide feedback and suggestions. What do you think we should be doing? Uh, share your ideas, you know, become involved. You know, my first involvement with MAS was by being a uh, symposium uh, chair about 14 years ago. And from there, I moved into other capacities. And it's been a lot of fun and of benefit to my company, the interactions that I've had along those uh, lines. So seriously consider becoming involved. Okay. So we just want to take a minute to talk about a few of the membership benefits. The first is reduced registration rates at the meetings. There's the annual microscopy and microanalysis meeting. It's the largest meeting for our community in the world. It's a world-class trade show with all the major instrument manufacturers. There are um, topical conferences that are proposed and run. Uh, there was not a topical conference this year due to the COVID crisis. But if you have an idea for a topical conference, you know, float it up. We're looking for new ideas, new um, communities to engage with and bring into the society. 
We also have the world-class technical journal, Microscopy and Microanalysis. It's the most highly ranked technical journal in our field. As mentioned, we have the ARIES network, and it's really network locally to have the um, people succeed in their profession by interacting with their local neighbors. Uh, ARIES also offers the MAS tour speaker program. Um, so years where travel is allowed and in-person meetings are allowed, be sure that your um, local chapter considers inviting and bringing in certain speakers. If there are speakers that you would like to have um, proposed, just let uh, somebody within MAS know. We're all very approachable. Okay, the one other thing that we'd like to mention is the society also does a very good job with professional recognition. There are annual awards for outstanding papers, science and service, and there are also student awards at the regional and national levels to support attendance at the events that we run. So, you know, with that said, what I'm going to do next is move into the second part of the talk. I work at GE Research, and what we like to say is it's the place where research meets reality. And why do we say that? You know, somebody comes up with an idea, you do some fundamental research in certain instances, but then a few years later, you see a real product out there, a real product that you guys who are listening to this presentation will be you know, utilizing in some way, shape or form. So that's very rewarding. Um, so it's a really fun place to work. If you boil down our mission, we could boil it down to a few words. We're solving the toughest technical problems that the world has and is facing. And you know, obviously the focus is on the areas that GE has the businesses. So a little bit of background information. GE, you know, is the first industrial research laboratory in the United States. Our facility was founded in uh, 1900. We're 120 years old. And Thomas Edison is often quoted as saying, I find out what the world needs, then I proceed to invent it. And a lot of us at the research center still keep that uh, quote in the back of our and that's kind of our work and philosophy. So at the research center today, we have about a thousand scientists and engineers. We have about 3000 patents issued per year across the company. In years where travel's allowed, there's about 60,000 people that visit um, annually across our facility. So I just wanna talk a little bit about where we've been and where we're going. Um, so GE has produced a large number of diverse products and the left panel shows what we've been able to discover, starting with the electric lamp in 1879. And if you look down in the lower right corner, you know, we have the largest additive manufacturing machine and in the healthcare industry, we have patient-guided mammography, which is very um, novel technology and products. So what differentiates us and what makes us stand out? The large number of patents. We're one of the top 10 global patent um, issuers. We have about 63,000 uh, patents. What we do cuts across many applications. So it's very cross-disciplinary. And, you know, when we do work, it's market tested before the products are deployed. So what's the impact of what we're doing? 
you could see in the top uh, right corner some um, photos and certain numbers of how many items are out in the field. But the bottom line is we generate about a third of the world's electricity. On years where um, we don't have COVID and people are traveling, a plane with a GE engine takes off about every two seconds. Every minute, about 16,000 medical images are collected using our technology. So there's a lot of research that went into enabling all that. We have all that in our um, toolkit that we uh, keep in the back of our mind when new items uh, and new queries come up. So on the right hand side of this slide in blue, you know, I show the different GE businesses. And the thing with the research center is we're at the center, we're at the hub, we do work for each of the different businesses. We also do research with strategic partners. We have government funded programs. So we're working with government agencies. There were certain GE businesses that were divested. We're still doing research with them. So we're at the hub. We could learn something from aviation. And then we realize, hey, you know, power's having an issue. We could transfer, you know, learnings and technology very rapidly. So that's an important thing that we bring to the table. Uh, we have a large innovation network. We're very good at knowledge sharing and documenting the findings. We have deep technical depth and breadth. So the last few words I wanna say about GE research is I'm in the characterization organization. And a few years ago, you know, we spun out to be able to do external analysis. So if you or your colleagues have needs and you can't perform analysis in house or locally, feel free to reach out to us. You know, we're also being encouraged to write external proposals so if you have ideas that you think are a match and a fit, you know, we could work on those. And the data that we collect really go into a number of different areas and answering a number of questions. Basically it's guide materials development, perform root cause analysis, you know, provide guidance to supply chain. But what I like to also remind people a lot of times we collect data that are used to um, generate uh, predictive models. We also uh, generate data that are used to validate, you know, theoretical simulation models that we develop. So what we do, you know, cuts across many needs within the company and the uh, larger scientific community. So at this point, I want to jump into the um, scientific uh, part of the talk where we're going to focus on surface microscopy and microanalysis. For many material systems, you know, the surface is where the action or the reactions take place. You know, accurate characterization is essential. A lot of times people bring us samples, say, tell me what's present. And what they really want to know is what do I need to change in my processing and how much? Or to rephrase it, which knob do I need to turn and how far? And that's what we help them do, as I'll show in a minute. So I rapidly just want to say a few words about surface versus bulk. In the top left corner, you can see the bulk of the material very clearly. And a lot of times a sample such as the device in the top right corner has either a film or multi-layer film stack on top of it. But you know, it's a question of what is a surface and what's a film. So thin films, you know, are typically tens of nanometers to a micron in thickness. 
However, there are also very thin films that are monolayerish to uh, tens of nanometers. An important point to note here, and I'll show some examples of this, is in this instance, you know, EDS, you know, really doesn't provide useful information. So a question is, what technique should I consider? So this is a busy chart, but it pretty much has a number of characterization techniques that are in many organizations. What we're going to focus on are the three that are in the uh, red rectangle. Um, and what we're showing with the um, white box is the uh, sampling depth just for spectroscopy. What we show when we have the black arrow is sampling depths uh, that are possible if we erode in depth profile into the material. From this chart, you could see that, you know, the sampling depth of TOF sims is the least and OJ and XPS are similar, but XPS slightly deeper. To be uh, a little more useful, I include the spot size of the instruments. A nice advantage of OJ is the small spot, typically being able to get down to 10 nanometers with state-of-the-art equipment. Um, the main advantage of TOF sims is being able to detect trace species. And on the slides that follow, you'll see that through example. So what I'd like to do is start by talking through some examples of OJ electron spectroscopy, referred to as AES. Uh, we have a Phi 700 XI instrument. Photos are shown here. Um, by OJ, an electron beam excites OJ electrons. All elements heavier than lithium are detected. Detection limits about half an atomic percent. The sampling depth is about 50 to 75 uh, angstroms. And for the instrument we have, uh, the spatial resolution, you know, can be defined by having a, a probe size of about six nanometers. So some nice examples on what we've been able to do with the instrument are on the slides that are coming up. So this is a wafer that had um, some discoloration and um, odd performance. The team that submitted the sample knew that these large features were iron and we were able to confirm that through OJ spectroscopy. But the query was the uh, fuzzy areas outside what's happening there and what's the composition. So just through a fast spectral analysis, we can see that iron and nickel are present. So the first evidence of, you know, a silicide. If we look away in other areas, the only thing that we're seeing is silicon and um, carbon and oxygen from ambient air exposure. So we know uh, from the first glimpse that there are certain areas that do have other types of uh, contaminants. After we know the elements present, you know, we could collect OJ images and the color overlays shown um, on the bottom panel. Again, what we could see right here is region one, you know, there's an iron silicide and that's very easily resolved through the image based upon the yellow color compared to the red, which is the um, silicon wafer and then the uh, green, um, you know, particles that are on the silicon wafer. One other thing that you could do by OJ is you know chemical state analysis and with the new instrument we have high energy resolution 
So again, if we look at the silicon KLL line by OJ spectroscopy, we could see different uh, chemical functionality. Point two, the silicon metal has a binding energy, um, a kinetic energy uh, that relates to the um, metallic silicon, whereas the uh, silicide, you know, shifted, and again, the kinetic energies in accord with what you would expect. So, a nice example where we could do small spot analysis by OJ. There are many instances and examples where people would like to analyze through the thickness. And the way we do that is through depth profiling and you collect a spectrum at the starting surface, use an ion beam to erode, get to the subsurface area, collect another spectrum, map the uh, distribution through the depth. Um, and the two things to note here is when you perform the depth profile analysis, the x-axis is in sputter time. What most of our colleagues want is sputter depth. So what we could do is take this sample, generate a cross-section, but analyze the cross-section by SEN, get the layer thickness, calculate the erosion rate, and once we know the erosion rate, then we're able to convert sputtering time to depth. The second thing is, you know, vendors supply sensitivity factors to enable quantitative analysis. But Lori um, oftentimes will take samples and use EPMA, you know, to verify the sensitivity factors or optimize the sensitivity factors. So having multiple pieces of complementary information at your disposal really gives you the best understanding of your materials. So depth profiling works great on a flat sample. A lot of the real samples that we get are rough. And what we show in this um, image is a typical fractured specimen. You know, the uh, topmost surface is rough. There's no way you're going to be able to depth profile through, you know, that um, surface layer. But what we can do is take the sample to the ex situ fib, generate, you know, a fib lift out, take the fib lift out, put it in the OJ instrument, obtain, you know, in situ SEM images to verify you're at the region of interest, and then use OJ to map the distribution of the elements that are present. So right away from the color overlay, we very nicely are able to define the layers that are present, the thickness of the layers, and, you know, since we have sensitivity factors, get accurate compositional information. Again, since the uh, fib area was on the larger side, we could go in, go to a second region, do analysis. Again, we have the SEM image and then the corresponding OJ um, color overlay, clearly identifying the layers that are present. Oftentimes when we do this type of analysis, we'll find surprises, you know, at the uh, interfaces or within the layers, missing layers, or a supplier that um, deposited something other than we were expecting. So people usually think of OJ as being problematic for the analysis of organic materials. A few years ago, we had a program where we were trying to learn from nature. So we were doing a lot of work with the uh, butterfly wings. And the one team, you know, functionalized butterfly wings and they needed to understand how the functionalization went. So in this 
uh, page, we could see in the top left corner, the SEM image, we could see the distribution of nitrogen throughout the cross section of the uh, butterfly wing and the nitrogens to be expected. There was an aluminum ALD layer. So right away by OJ, we were able to say that the uh, ALD layer is pretty conformal. And then, you know, the ALD treated butterfly wing was exposed to gold nanoparticles. Here we are able to see the presence of the uh, nanoparticles. So again, a lot of people would say you can't analyze organics by OJ, but there are new tricks that the community is coming up with. You know, thinning of the sample, similar to you would do with TEM to allow the beam to pass through the sample. Low energy ion beam exposure, to stabilize the surface charge. You know, thin coatings, you know, tilting the material. Um, so sometimes you have to take a more novel approach to the analysis. The final example I want to show for OJ is again another um, non-standard sample. It was a reverse osmosis membrane sample. Uh, it was a standard TEM uh, sample prep. You know, it, the material was microtome. From the SEM images, as you start getting to higher magnification, you start seeing defects. This was the main defect in question, and they want to know compositionally what's happening. So right away from the OJ spectra, you could tell silicon's present. You could generate an OJ map of silicon and it nicely mimics, you know, what we're seeing with the SEM image. Knowing the species that was present in the defect allowed the team to go optimize processing to keep this from happening. So on the pages that I just went through, I hope that you saw some novel applications of OJ electron spectroscopy. Uh, we have many more, um, but you know, with a limited time, what I'd like to do is move on to X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. The difference with X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, the X-ray beam excites electron emission. All elements uh, heavier than helium are detected. A similar detection efficiency. The sampling depth is very similar to OJ. However, you know, the spatial resolution is a bit degraded. So one nice example and where XPS has been a workhorse is the analysis of polymeric materials. On the left-hand panel of this screen, I show a variety of different um, routine polymers that are used in the field. And on the top right corner, I show an XPS spectrum. So right away from the XPS spectrum, you could see oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen are present. So that allows you to down select what your polymeric material is in this case. The um, percent um, area under each peak can be used for quantitative analysis. So that further helps refine which uh, polymer is present. But with uh, XPS, you could also go in, do high um, energy line scan analysis of uh, the different elements. And here we show the high energy region for carbon. Right away, we could see the different carbon functionality present. We could determine the percent of each functionality present. So the combination of knowing the elements present, the amount of the elements present, and then, you know, the bonding allows us to accurately identify polymeric materials that may be present.
The same applies for um, inorganic systems. On this uh, page, you know, it was a um, moly oxide uh, cluster that was grown on silicon dioxide. Again, we find through the spectra the main species that are present. But here, our colleague needed to know and verify the oxidation states of molybdenum that were uh, in this um, configuration for growing of the uh, cluster. So from deconvolution of the measured um, high energy uh, spectra, you know, we're able to determine how much of the different oxidation states are present. Again, that allowed our customers to verify that they obtained what they needed, optimize their processing, and move to the next step. On the two slides that follow, you know, I want to walk through microelectronics uh, delamination. What you see in the top of part of the figure, there's a pad that looks correct and normal, and it's ITO on Molly on a silicon nitride film, which is all on top of glass. Right below the normal, normal uh, looking uh, pad is a pad that has a defective region. The sample is first submitted to OJ, and right away OJ said that you know, in area A where the film is present and everything's fine, yes, we do have ITO. Region B, the ITO is missing. However, nitrogen's appearing. So the question right away became, what's the um, functionality of the nitrogen? In order to obtain that, the sample was shifted to XPS. By XPS, we could generate the um, images, you know, of the elements of interest. And again, we see clearly the delamination from the uh, main elements. If we map the other key elements, what we notice, the delaminated area shown carbon, and nitrogen, as we knew by OJ. But remember, what we wanted to get is the chemical um, functionality of the nitrogen. So what Hong was able to do is take the data set, so the full nitrogen signal, which is shown by the image in the top right corner, and by the nitrogen um, curve shown by the spectra, do principal component analysis on the um, data. And what popped out are two different um, components. One component, that's the moly, uh, the nitride. So the moly nitride part of the peak here, and then the corresponding image. And then the organic nitrogen, and again, the organic nitrogen is at the delaminated uh, area. So by principal component analysis of the uh, data, Hong was able to nicely show that organic nitrogen is present at the delaminated interface. Again, knowing the form of nitrogen was critical to fixing the problem because another scenario could have been nitrogen, you know, migration, you know, from the silicon nitride uh, underlying film. The final example I want to show for XPS is some uh, novel work that we did with in situ heating. And there was a program where they want to understand what happens with barium azide as it's heated in the lower um, set of uh, curves, we could see the as measured nitrogen 1S uh, spectra, and then the curve fit to it. And then just heating to 52 degrees Celsius, we start seeing some uh, significant changes. 
So what's happening? With mild teething, we start forming different uh, nitrogen intermediates. So we're able to start understanding how the material is changing. As we get up to higher temperatures, essentially about 200 Celsius or above, you know, we've transformed the barium azide into barium nitride. And, you know, upon cooling to room temperature, the barium nitride, you know, remains. So this is a nice example because it really shows how we could um, verify mechanisms and also optimize the processing conditions. So the final technique that we're going to speak about is time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry. And, you know, with TOF sims, we have a primary ion beam that strikes the sample. The surface species are ejected. They're analyzed by the um, reflectron. They're detected, and we get a full spectrum. So with TOF sims, a full spectrum is um, analyzed at every volume element. Main advantages here is we're able to detect down to the part per billion level. We're able to image hydrogen and its isotopes. We're able to analyze molecular fragments, as I'll show in a minute. And we've also been very successful at deep depth profiling. And in addition to being able to just collect a spectrum at every depth, with TOF sims, we could do 3D analysis, and the benefits of that will be shown in a few slides. So on the top of this figure, I show um, in situ photos, there was a uh, gold pad. The query was, is copper present? Within a few seconds, we were very clearly able to show, yes, copper is present. With the high mass resolution, we don't have interference from the neighboring hydrocarbon. We could show that the copper spread uniformly across the uh, pad. And although we don't have relative sensitivity factors for quantitative analysis, based upon all the other techniques that we use to try to detect copper, we know that the concentration is less than 900 part per billion. A few years ago, we had a um, business where they were saying that part of a device is discolored and it's not coming across well on my screen. Hopefully it is on yours. But there was regions that were a dark color versus a light color. So the ask is collect spectra, tell me what's different. What I was able to do is map a large area by doing a stage scanning. And the first thing that we notice, the light area is enriched with a surface contaminant of PDMS, which is a silicone oil. The dark area, you know, has the nominal species that should be present, chrome and nickel. So by Analyzing over the large area, we could clearly map, show the area that had the uh, defect, conclusively answer the question, what is present? And by follow-up conversations, we were able to identify the source of the PDMS. And by resolving the issue early, the product um, was able to launch in a timely fashion. So a nice example where we're able to detect the unexpected by doing large area analysis. A few years ago, um, we also had a business that was depositing thin films. So this is a photo of the um, deposition equipment. So they have ITO targets on the right panel. They have areas that are typically empty. They were wanting to store material in these um, bins, but they need to be concerned about contaminants. So they put glass into the um, 
target slots. They deposited about 100 microns of ITO on uh, other materials using the targets in um, bays three and four. They took the samples out, they analyzed by uh, EDS, they weren't able to detect any surface contaminants. ITO wasn't present by EDS. By SIMS, you know, we were very easily able to show that, yes, tin is present in the different areas. Um, the quantification here was based upon correlations with XPS data collected on a higher dose sample. Um, the important point, you know, the right technique should be used for the analysis. If it's a very thin layer, oftentimes EDS is going to look right through it and not detect a very thin layer. By SIMS, we also do a lot of work of looking at molecular species. Probably about 15 years ago now, um, a colleague came in and said, can we detect this polymeric additive in a polymer? Uh, the additives BN POS. The nice thing is he had control samples because right away I couldn't say, yes, we can see and differentiate this from an unknown polymer. So the unknown polymer did not have any peaks at high mass. When we looked at the pure BM POS, we were able to detect molecular uh, fragments. So we were able to say, yes, we can try to analyze your film. So the next thing they did was brought us a film that was loaded with 2% BM POS. Again, we could detect it. When we imaged across a 500 micron area, you know, we found that it was clustering. They thought it was going to be uniformly distributed over the 500 micron area. So not only could we detect the high mass molecular information, but we were also able to show the uniformity. You know, I mentioned butterfly and analysis by um, OJ earlier. The same team was uh, staining butterfly wings with uh, metal porphyrin complexes. Again, they wanted to know if we could um, image the distribution of the uh, molecular species. The molecular species is shown in the top right panel. And, you know, we could see by SIMS, we are able to detect molecular fragments indicative of the um, porphyrin. We're able to also go in and map the distribution and show that, you know, the um, porphyrin is at the uh, edges of the scales. Now, the important point to note, the edges of the butterfly scales are hydrophilic and the hydrophilicity stems from large quantities of polysaccharides that are present, which are exposed at the edges. So um, we were able to verify what was expected, um, but it's a nice example that, you know, people could relate to. So, Early ion sources for SIMS were monoatomic and they were able to um, provide a lot of useful information. The earliest sources didn't have a tight focus and that's when the community went with gallium and bismuth. However, there was an increased desire to get the more molecular information than I showed on the previous slides. So cluster ion sources became available. And within the past um, two decades, really cluster ion sources for depth profiling. So this is an example where we eroded and sampled through an organic solar cell. Again, you know, we're able to track the distribution of the species of interest. 
we do notice, you know, enrichment of certain species, you know, at the interface. However, the most important learning for this team wasn't the fact that, you know, the composition was uniform through the depth. It was the presence of nitrogen functionality at the interface. Again, this is something that was not at all expected, but by having the full mass spectrum, you know, at every voxel, we were able to identify that. I mentioned that by SIMS, we could do 3D analysis. In the top left panel, you know, we show a multicolor overlay um, where we're depth profiling in the Z dimension. What I'd like to point out here is the different colors are represented by spectra and the spectra were generated through unbiased multivariate statistical analysis. Uh, multivariate statistical analysis is very powerful and useful when analyzing uh, materials, especially unknowns. And if you look in detail, you know, there's an interfacial layer, but when you look at it by multivariate analysis, you can see there's a green region versus a light blue region, and they're chemically different. In the blue region, we're saying alkalis that correlate with um, chlorine and cadmium oxide. You know, in the uh, green uh, area, we're saying that the cadmium oxide does not correlate with the terrelium oxide in this example. So when we generate, you know, a crater by depth profiling, you know, the side walls are always pretty ugly. Um, you know, there's been talk about it would be great if while you're doing the depth profile, you could do accurate microscopy of the side wall. And, you know, that just isn't possible. But a few years ago, a former colleague, Dustin Ellis and I worked together and Dustin was able to take a crater, go in, and start shaving the crate, uh, the uh, roughness on the side wall. And what we were able to show is that after a few fib cuts, and typically it wound up being five fib cuts, about 10 microns in, you know, we start seeing the layer structures that are expected. Uh, the, the last example I want to show rapidly by Sims kind of pulls everything that we've said earlier together. Um, in situ fib Sims of lithium battery materials. So the top left panel shows an uh, second ion induced secondary electron image. Here's the region of interest that's going to be analyzed. With a positive polarity, you know, we see the distribution of the species of interest. In addition to lithium, we could also get information about lithium um, molecular fragments, as well as unexpected additives. And if we crop this image and then do multivariate analysis, we get even more information. And again, what I'm showing here are the factors that are generated. And for each factor, we have a mass spectrum, which when interpreted really tells you the full story of what's happening in an unbiased fashion. So again, examples of the um, OJ, XPS, and TOF SIMS. You know, where's the surface analysis community going? Everybody's going to smaller analytical spots, higher detection efficiency, faster analysis, high mass or energy resolution, uh, less beam damage, hyperspectral imaging, increased automation, but, you know, we still need the skilled operators. And hybrid instrumentation is becoming very popular, 
especially um, in the Sims world and XPS um, coupled with other uh, complementary techniques such as ramen and, you know, adding other capabilities onto OJ instrumentation. So in summary, you know, characterization helps understand the material behavior. Oftentimes it's a combination of techniques that provides the best answer. Um, what we like to do is not just say what's present, but tell our colleagues what the uh, results mean. And, you know, we have a diverse set of uh, tools that could be used to provide uh, complementary information. And usually surface analysis complements the traditional microscopy techniques. Uh, so I'd like to thank, you know, the entire surface analysis community at the research center, uh, including the former members. There's a bunch of work that I didn't show in collaboration with external collaborators. I'd like to thank everybody that provided the samples, uh, the researchers that provide the materials, and all of you for attending. And while uh, addressing any questions that may have come up, <clears throat> you know, I just want to have a uh, background slide on characterization innovation at the research center. And the items that are highlighted in red are items that are um, of interest to the MAS community. Um, so with that, you know, if there are questions, I'd like to uh, entertain them. Uh, the second thing is if people have questions after the presentation, reach out, you know, I'm always available through uh, email, phone discussions, and, you know, hopefully uh, the future microscopy meeting. Okay, Vin, thank you very much. That was great. Um, and yes, we have a few questions. Um, the first one, and there are more coming in. Um, the first one came in right at the beginning of the talk and is probably uh, easy to answer. Is MAS a local organization or national? So MAS is national, but again, the ARIES is where it's your local community. So um, if you reach out to any of us, we will put you in contact with your um, local um, community. We definitely want you engaging with them and hopefully with us as well. Good. And the next question is um, about TOFSIMS. Um, in one of your uh, slides, uh, in the TOFSIM section, you mentioned new TOFSIMs that can go down to a 10 nanometer spot size. size. Um, this is very impressive. Which vendor or manufacturer um, offers this kind of new tool? Well, right now, all the instrument manufacturers are working on, um, you know, new tools and upgrades to their tools. Uh, the one that I'm the most familiar with because, you know, I use their products and, you know, follow them the most closely is, you know, IonTOF. Uh, they have a new tool that's out that you may want to look at. And it's also important to note that, you know, I'm aware of people that have compared NanoSIMS that are uh, um, collected on the Kamika instrument with uh, TOFSIMS that are uh, from the newer uh, tools. And, you know, a lot of times having the full mass spectrum of every volume element really gives you additional information that's of critical importance as opposed to just uh, two or three uh, species that you could analyze. Great. Um, the next question is also regarding SIMS data, and I hope I can pronounce everything correct. So regarding NVSA of SIMS data, any methods you could advise to export INTOF proprietary files for processing outside their software? Um, there are, so, okay. 
The work that I was doing early on was in collaboration with Sandia National Labs, and it was a great uh, collaboration. Um, and their tools were the most robust at that time. Uh, IONTOF has just come out with new software that has um, MVSA algorithms built in and the MS, MVSA data that I showed for the uh, lithium battery that was uh, collected and generated using the IONTOF uh, software. So I would suggest reaching out to, you know, IONTOF. And, you know, if you need access to other tools, uh, send me an email message and I could um, put you in contact with others. The next question is more going towards sample handling uh, of lithium samples. So do you use a container to protect lithium samples from air that can be opened inside the instrument sample chambers? I mean, that is a critical, important question. I mean, ambient air can affect the materials. Uh, for what I showed, you know, we were most interested in the subsurface area that was fibbed. So the sample handling wasn't as critical, but uh, for XPS analysis, we do have, you know, an inert transfer vessel that can be used. And if and when there's a need, you know, we could um, devise something for SIMS as well. But sampling handling is of critical importance. And if you think about it, all the surface tools are analyzing the topmost surface. So any surface contaminants could really jeopardize your materials. So care needs to be taken. Okay, another question is for 10 to 30 nanometers or even smaller particles on the surface, can AES has uh, a chance to analyze them? Or are there other techniques that you can recommend? For particles that small, usually we would start with OJ. And the thing when you're selecting the best tool, you know, is the spot size that you need as well as the composition, you know, for the query that's being asked, you know, they're probably most interested in more of the um, major constituent composition, so they don't need trace species. You know, with SIMS and the newer instruments, you'd be able to get some useful information, uh, but again, it highly depends upon the material, and there would be a possibility or probability that the images would be a bit blurred. Okay, and then uh, another question is, how confident are you using XPS or other techniques to establish an absolute concentration reference point for TOFSIMS? Any worries about diff differences in analysis depth or and or volume? Uh, that's a good question. Um, again, you know, what that team needed was just knowing, yes, the ITO is or is not present. Um, the fact that we had, you know, the ballpark sensitivity factors based upon correlations with XPS, uh, and the fact that we want to show that, yeah, there are non-standard ways of converting the qualitative SIMS information to quantitative. That's why I showed it in that fashion. But one always needs to be very cautious in providing quantitative numbers. Okay, and then uh, another question is regarding XPS imaging. Um, are there any methods to correct distortion due to charging and or inherent optics geometry? I am, okay, I haven't done XPS analysis myself for 20 years. I have to admit that. Um, so I don't play with the uh, software. Um, I believe there are, uh, if you send me a uh, offline email uh, message, 
you know, I could um, provide a uh, better answer for you. Okay, so this is um, what came in from the attendees so far. Um, I actually have a question myself um, that I wondered. Um, so a lot of uh, all these techniques can be quite complementary and um, correlative microscopy microanalysis, of course, is a big uh, part of it. So would what, what would you say are uh, common challenges and, and strategies when it comes to, um, for example, sample prep, um, when it comes to uh, doing surface analysis? Well, the, the first thing that a lot of people don't realize is sit down, talk with the person that's requesting the analysis. Uh, because again, they may say, tell me what's present, and that's not going to help them answer that problem. Um, so I think that once you start the dialogue, what do you really need before they generate the sample and bring it to you, then you could outline how should they prepare the sample? You know, how fast should they get you the sample? You know, what is the best strategy for the most reliable um, set of analysis that'll be forthcoming? And then, you know, when you're doing the analysis, you always have to be thinking, do the results that I'm obtaining, you know, make sense? Uh, could there be something going awry that's, you know, um, complicating the data analysis and possibly giving um, misleading information or the wrong answer? Okay. Good, so great, thank you. Um, so if there are no other questions, I would say we conclude the webinar at this point. As Vin said, he's happy to hear any questions um, at a later time um, and you can reach out to him. Um, and um, yeah, uh, another request was in general uh, to have a way to, give applause. I think in this uh, format, we don't quite have that. So I will, um, in the name of all attendees, give you a round of applause. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, uh, thank you everyone for attending our very first webinar. We hope to have um, more uh, content coming up. Um, we recorded this webinar and we'll, um, put it on our MAS YouTube channel. And um, yeah, thanks everyone again for coming in. And uh, thanks again for Vin for giving such a great talk. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, thanks for all your background help and pulling this off and making it work. It was kind of odd, you know, talking into a computer, not seeing the audience, um, not being able to gauge the responses and not being able to field questions at the, normal pause points but you know i think um it went over well and you know i was happy to be the uh, first uh, speaker thanks again for the invitation okay so yep this concludes it um have a great day everyone